and welcome, as always, to At Issue. I'm H. Wayne Wilson. We have an opportunity to talk about what kind of mental health services exist in central Illinois. I know that uh, there was a tendency to simplify when the state hospital existed in Bartonville. We assumed that all mental health services were at that location. And likewise with the George A. Zeller Mental Health Center that closed in 2002. What has happened to mental health services in central Illinois? We'll discuss that with three of the leaders in that arena. Dr. Arun Pinto is with us. Dr. Pinto is the medical director at the Human Service Center and he also operates what is called Mental Health Court. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Thank you Dr. Pinto for being with us. Thank you. Uh, joining us also is Dr. Ryan Finkenbein. Dr. Finkenbein is a professor at the University of Illinois College of Medicine at Peoria where he is the chair of the Clinical Psychiatry and Behavioral Medicine Department. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me. And uh, if we're going to talk about mental health, we're going to have to have Dave Leach on the program. For those of you who don't know his involvement, of course you know he's a state representative, a Republican representing Peoria and other regions. But he was critical in the transition from the services at, at Zeller Mental Health Center to the current program. And we're going to talk about how he did that in just a moment. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Representative H. Leach. Uh, before we talk about the transition, I, I think it's probably appropriate to define mental health. What are we, when, when we go on numerous sites, you read about there's 400 different types and subtypes, et cetera, and it becomes very confusing. You see terms like Asperger's and bipolar, et cetera. So is there a simplified definition of mental health? Probably not. Um, I think in a sense, uh, the reference you're making is to uh, the number of uh, criterion-based diagnoses that we have in a manual that, that psychiatrists and psychologists and social workers use to help us almost talk to each other. And, uh, and from that, you have these diagnoses, Asperger's disorder, uh, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, depression. Um, but ultimately, all of those diagnoses um, relate to an inability to function at somebody's full capacity um, because of some mental health reason. And mental health doesn't, it isn't necessarily a permanent condition. I mean, anxiety is an example of something that can be very temporary. Yes. Uh, there, are, there are some mental illnesses that are lifelong illnesses, but, but you know, it used to be considered that if you had, for example, a schiz an illness like schizophrenia, that was your destiny. You couldn't get any better. You had to be maintained for the rest of your life with support. We now have taken a completely di different approach and believe differently. We'll, we believe people can recover from mental illness, and many do. We introduced at the Human Service Center a process that we're very proud of. We graduate people, uh, which is wonderful because they've, you know, they've done and learned all we can teach them in terms of managing their serious mental illness, and then they graduate into the community, oftentimes they need to continue their medicine, but they do that with their primary care physician uh, or, or whoever. They don't need the, the, the continued services that we have to give them, which are much more intense. Before we have a discussion with Representative Leach, I want to uh, extend sympathies from all of us to the family of Dean Steiner. Dean heads up the mental health uh, services at Methodist Medical Center in Peoria and his father passed away this week and we extend sympathies to the entire Steiner family. Methodist uh, has certain facilities, uh, Human Service Center offers uh, services and we're going to talk about a residency program at the University of Illinois College of Medicine but let's back up a little bit. You were heavily involved in the close, closure of Zeller Mental Health uh, Center. Why do you think that was a good idea, and what, were, what did you do and are doing to make sure that the services didn't disappear? Well, Zeller, like the other state uh, mental health facilities, are unbelievably expensive, as much in some locations as a quarter million dollars per client. Uh, and in Peoria, it was about $160,000 per client which really did not serve the purpose of helping people with mental illness. It was more about propping up antique, uh, antiquated um, procedures for trying to address mental illness. And for example, someone would be a Zeller for 20, 22, 23 days. Today, they would be in Methodist 
for perhaps up to 10 or 12 days because they would have far better care, case management, and be successful in getting on a path to recovery. Uh, George Ryan, Governor Ryan, asked me to cooperate with the state in closing as a model, one of the first uh, facilities which should be closed. And so I agreed and worked closely with the community-based partners here to come up with a plan to accomplish that. Uh, first and foremost was delivering mental health services at the community-based level. And I might emphasize that. In my own case, I had a brother, I have a brother two years younger than I. And I'll never forget, when just before I was going off to college, how he totally decompensated, uh, had to be um, treated. And no one in our family had the most remote idea what was going on, nor did they have the faintest idea where to access help. And so it's always been my very strong belief that we need to do everything we can to promote local community-based agencies who provide the whole continuum of services as it relates to mental, mental health. And for clarification for the audience, there were, I believe, 10 uh, equivalents to Zeller uh, at the time. At the time, now there are nine. So and the every program year, never progressed past Well, every year people say they want to close them, but predominantly it's the strength of the unions to keep them open. Uh, Governor Quinn, in fact, said that he wouldn't countenance uh, closing any of the state facilities um, and would not countenance anyone being fired or transitioned from those facilities. So it really has been an ongoing issue throughout the state for many years. Many people want to see them closed, but it's been a, a very expensive battle to, to be waged. In, in the absence of a Zeller in the Peoria area, a, an organization that meets, on, I, I think, on a regular basis called the Coalition for Mental Health Recovery Tell me a little bit about... Well, with the closure of Zeller, I thought it important that the community-based agencies um, stick together, and I wanted certainly to help in every way that I could to transition to a community-based level of service for, for the uh, constituents of this area. And so, uh, and it's a good thing I did, because as soon as Governor Ryan left office, the agreements that we had made were worthless in the eyes of Governor Bogoyevich. And so we've been struggling ever since with the state to get promised resources specifically to Methodists as well as others to provide the uh, level of community-based services. And I think that would be an important point to note. The problem with mental health services in our state is not that we don't have Zeller anymore. It's the failure of the state to provide resources to the community-based agencies who are doing the work and who are making those services available to real people. For example, in this year, the governor dished out 336 million bucks to, in pay raises to the state bureaucrats, people who work for the state, and at the same time put community-based agencies you know, at death's door. And so the issue that I continue to fight and so many of us do is to get act, uh, funded to support the community-based efforts, which is where the, the real work is done. For, for us as a community, though, I must point out, it's a tremendous asset to have Representative Leach. You, you, you don't have to call your legislator to tell him what you're concerned about. We meet with him every week. And so whenever an issue comes up that we need to talk about, uh, we have an ear to Springfield directly, and, and, and he acts on it. So it's really wonderful to, for this community. And I often you know, say when I go to national meetings that this is a luxury that not many people have, to have the state representative meet with them on a regular basis every week to talk about our troubles. It's tremendous. 
Representative Leach mentioned uh, Methodist Medical Center. That is the organization, the hospital that picked up, uh, in, in a sense, picked up some of the Zeller load. Uh, can you describe a little bit about what kind of services they provide? Well, at the time uh, that Zella closed, I was still practicing and working at Methodist. And with, with his assistance, uh, we went from 20 ad adult beds, I believe, to 46 or 47 adult beds. Uh, we created a whole separate unit, probably for the more chronically mentally ill uh, patients that needed a higher intensity of care. They also have uh, a child and adolescent unit that uh, is... 23 or 24 beds, I believe, that stays full most of the time. They've always been a champion of mental health, uh, even even before Zella closed, and and after Zella closed, they they rose to the came to the plate much much more. And Representative Leach helped with all of that. He helped them. He helped us to develop uh, community-based services so that uh, everybody works together now, which is which is a very effective system. And continuing along with Methodist Medical Center, the University of Illinois College of Medicine at Peoria has added an 11th residency, and that is in psychiatry. And that is in conjunction with Methodist. That's correct. Yeah, the, the uh, Methodist Medical Center of Illinois is, is the sponsoring uh, institution for the residency. The College of Medicine uh, manages it and administers it and teaches the residents who will be coming in, but it's the hospital that has come to the table uh, with uh, resources that will make the, the residency possible. And the residency starts in July, so um, uh, you know, we're all looking forward to, to bringing in some new doctors here. When you say bringing in new doctors, uh, and, and for those that don't understand a residency, after you get your MD degree, you are a doctor, but you must go through a residency of your choosing to practice in the state of Illinois, and if psychiatry, it's a four-year residency? Yeah, that's correct. And, and so the purpose behind this is to fill a void? Yeah, there's a, you know, before I came here, and I'll, I'll mention that, that Representative Leach and Dr. Pinto and Michael Bryant and others that we've, you know, mentioned here were instrumental in recruiting me to Peoria uh, to, to, among other things, um, establish a residency at the College of Medicine. And, and prior to coming here, I, I looked to see, first of all, was there a need for it? And, um, and was able to um, look at some numbers, at least population size, and kind of look at the geography of central Illinois and found that uh, this is a very underserved area. Um, now, interestingly, there's lots of resources available, but as has been mentioned, sometimes it's a shifting of funding and getting them to the right places. Um, uh, so there's some efficiency involved there. But just looking at sheer numbers, there was a, a, a reduced number of physicians in psychiatry uh, for this population catchment area. Um, and so bringing a residency to Peoria uh, should allow, by, by all measures, uh, a number of those uh, physicians to stay in the area. Now, they may not practice right in Peoria, but in Bloomington and Galesburg and Eureka and different places, uh, one of the predictors of where people practice is where they did their training. So that was one of the purposes for bringing it here. Uh, let's talk a little bit about law enforcement. We know that many individuals who end up in one of the county jails have mental health issues, but it's difficult to get services to them. Does your organization, your coalition, try to <coughs> coordinate services for that population? Oh, very definitely. We work very closely with uh, Sheriff McCoy, who also has been a statewide leader in this connection. Uh, Arun, why don't you describe our independent health center? The Integrated Health Center? The Integrated Health yeah. Center. That was, that was a model that uh, we were kind of leaders in the, in the field in. We talked to somebody in uh, Bear County, Texas, that had what they called an integrated center. And so with a federal grant, we decided to open one of our own. And, and the purpose of the, the integrated health center was to try to divert people either from jail or from the mental health, uh, or for the, from the emergency rooms into a treatment facility. So when we trained the police officers extensively, we talked to the emergency rooms extensively, we opened a center where the patient could come in instead of going to, a, you know, spending six or seven hours in the emergency room, could come in in a living room style, meet with, with a counselor, often a counselor who was a peer who'd been through mental illness themselves, and, and be helped through the crisis. And the following morning, uh, they would, uh, I would go in and see them and do a psychiatric evaluation. And uh, it was a partnership with Heartland, so the, the physician from Heartland would come in and do a physical examination. And so we connected people up not, not only with mental health services, but also with primary care services. 
So it was a it was a tremendous project that was just starting to get off the ground uh, when, wouldn't you believe it, the funds ceased, and so we had to we had to close it. The reference to Heartland is Heartland Community Health Clinic. They have four clinics in the Peoria uh, area, and that really was uh, an indispensable part of it. Heartland Clinic could provide a medical home for the individuals who were coming to the center. And the other point I would make is probably 20, 25 percent of the 18 or 19,000 bookings in Peoria County are repeat offenders. Repeat in the sense that they're in and out, in and out. And so there's tremendous interest by the county officials and city officials for that matter to provide care instead of jail for many of these individuals because it's a great waste of officer time, booking time, just it's a big hassle to go through that when really what the individuals need is more in line with what we were and will one day continue to offer here in our community. Well, let's talk about that because uh, understanding the state's fiscal constraints, is there any hope that funding at, at any level might resurrect that integrated health service? Well, we're going to certainly be working very hard to accomplish that. Actually, at this point, more dangerous is the threat of having anyone who's not on Medicaid not get any more services, as has been the case. And that is a giant step in the wrong direction. Uh, the bureaucracy soaks up so much of this money that the uh, choice has been to uh, strangle the community-based agencies. And that, that's just wrong. But that's what's been occurring, and that, frankly, is what our fight this whole spring is going to be about in large measure. Along the lines of, of uh, the, we were talking about jails and how many people need have mental health services. You've helped to institute a mental health court just recently. Well, I won't take credit for it myself, but I've been a part of a team that started help, a mental help. health court. <laughs> it, it's, you know, it, Having worked at the Human Service Center about seven years now, I, I you know, saw how many of our patients uh, cycle in and out of jail for, for things that they've often done in the midst of, of a psychotic episode or because of poor judgment or because of substance abuse. We've, we've had in this community for many years uh, a drug court where, where people, because of their substance abuse issues, ended up committing crime. And so... Uh, came before a court and were mandated by the court to get treatment and monitored by the court. But there was no parallel for mental health. And so we were, we were able to procure a grant, or the city was able to procure a grant. I don't know whether the city or the county was able to procure a grant um, to, to, to have a similar model for mental health. Uh, and so we started the mental health court. Judge Warden uh, got the parties that be together in, in rapid speed and uh, uh, designed a system that, that worked. And uh, uh, so now when somebody, as a, as a virtue of virtue, virtue is the wrong word, as a result of their mental illness, uh, commits a crime, if it's a non-violent or non-felonious crime, and if they have the wherewithal to understand what's going on, they can then elect to be a part of mental health court. And in doing so, they, they plead guilty to the crime they put themselves under the umbrella of the mental health court where they, they agree then to comply with treatment. Uh, regular meetings with their, uh, with their case managers, with the psychiatrist, with their probation officer. And after uh, serving that amount of time and having progressed through the system, their charge is then dropped so that they, they have a clean record. Uh, and, talk, and there's a judge that oversees the, it. The judge, judge, judge Michael Brand. Yeah, exactly, Judge Brand. It was interesting you talked about the coalition earlier, and recently we had an occasion uh, in the coalition to have the first mental health court patient come in himself and talk to the, to the community about what his experience was like. And inspiring. It was, it was very inspiring. Very yeah. impressive. I mean, this person was really at the depths, and he not only uh, was not bashful, no. He wanted to sing from the mountaintop about the success that he had enjoyed in this program and the whole 
future that he had now that he had never dreamed he would have before. It goes beyond, you know, helping the persons, you know, who are entered into the mental health court. I mean, there are, uh, th this is, it's new to this area, and I think the model that's been set up is sort of the state-of-the-art model um, that, of, of other models that have been tested, but other, other states have had these, and, and it's, not a, it's not brand new. Uh, but because other states have, have tested this and have had them around for um, uh, years, there's a, n a large number of studies that show that the recidivism goes down, uh, the cost overall is much, much less, and, and hopefully, uh, as you say, this spring, we'll, we'll have an opportunity to make sure that the same thing that happened to the Integrated Health Center doesn't happen to the mental health court, where there's a grant to kind of get something started, and then for lack of foresight, uh, I think it, that money kind of fades away and, and, this, and the program has to close. W what has to happen is there has to be a shifting of funding, uh, for example, with the closure of Zeller. You know, you don't need all $160,000 per patient. You, you need some of that to create greater efficiency, possibly in a private setting or in the community. Um, and and you also have to look at the cost savings. So the, the, the cost of the, of the mental health court uh, has some uh, price tag to it, but the cost of not having it is much higher because you have people in and out of the jail, you have uh, greater uh, recidivism, you have appeals, you have court time. There's a, there's a huge amount of cost, and, and if, if the legislature can track that, they'll find that, in, at least in other jurisdictions, uh, the cost savings is enormous, and, and uh, hopefully that's not going to happen again in this, in this scenario. And I assume that the, uh, the many services that Human Service Center provides, the, uh, the Adam Street Living Center for the Homeless and the Assertive Community Treatment, yes. et cetera, those are all, uh, they may be expensive, but they're much cheaper than the alternative. Absolutely. And, and not only cheaper, they're more effective than the alternative. The alternative was to spend three months in the hospital, come out ill-equipped to deal with life. Uh, these programs now help people deal with real life, learn how to you know, make groceries, learn how to make a budget. Uh, there's a strong evidence-based treatment that's called supported employment, where people are uh, helped to find jobs. We have a team of five or six case managers who actually help people write resumes, help them go to interviews, train them to do that. And then once they're hired, they'll spend three to six months with them making sure they keep the job, uh, doing whatever they can to help them resolve conflict, you know, deal appropriately with their mental illness in the, in the, in the work setting, but to, but to then stay working, which, which has the best outcomes, supported employment, supported housing, medication. These are all evidence-based treatments that work for serious mental illness. And uh, Dr. Finkenbein, as an individual who has come from other states, uh, West Virginia most recently, and you've had an opportunity now to view the coordinated efforts in Central Illinois. How would you rate how Central Illinois is doing in providing services to those with mental health needs? I think all the, the, the resources are here, and if they're not here, they're coming. Um, there's certainly some areas that um, you, know, you could look at and say we could improve. Uh, as always, you're always going to sort of strive for, for doing better. But I, I think the days of, of operating in silos where there are different levels of care, different locations of care, uh, miscommunications or a lack of communication entirely uh, between different agencies, let's say, um, aren't completely gone, but they're starting to come down. And I think, uh, as you've heard, you know, th this community has uh, a degree of communication and collaboration like none other than I've been in. Um, you have uh, the different parties talking to each other, may not always agree, but for the most part there's an open forum for those things to happen, whether it's a, a, a strictly a forum like the coalition, or whether it's just picking up the phone call and talking to the Human Service Center and saying, uh, does this patient that I have on my inpatient center, when they leave, are they going to be able to afford this medication? Because it doesn't do a lot of good if I put them on a medication that, that may work if the next day they leave and now they're being followed up by uh, Dr. Pinto. Uh, they can't afford the medication. So that communication has, has to occur. And I think this, this uh, if we don't have all the systems in place now, at least the process for getting to, to there, I would, I would give an A+. Plus. I mean, it's terrific. And the coalition is part of this communication? Very definitely. We're trying to both identify what needs to be done and figure out strategies to accomplish it. And as uh, Dr. Finkenbein said, one of the most important elements of this is the communication and the collaboration. Because uh, when you have everything fragmented, the opportunity for miscommunication to have issues slip through the cracks, I mean, it's, it's a recipe for that. 
So I think that's one of the most important things that we've accomplished. And on that important note, we have run out of time. I'd like to say thank you to Dr. Arun Pinto, who is the, with the Human Service Center. Thank you for being with thank us. Thank you for having Dr. me. Dr. Finkenbein, Dr. Ryan Finkenbein at the University of Illinois College of Medicine at Peoria. Thank, thank you. you. And as always, Representative Dave Leach, thank you always for being a pleasure. on Thanks. that issue. Uh, please join us next week for another edition of that issue when we'll be talking with the new, he's not yet in office, but the new city manager. He'll be joining us, at, that's the Peoria city manager, for those of you that haven't been paying attention to the news. We'll be talking to Patrick Urich next week here on At Issue.